Mr. Mercer, Mr. Chris Mercer. Testing, one, two. Thank you. Thanks so much, what's your name? Ricky. Hey, let's give it up for Ricky. He helped us get these mics, because otherwise you might not be able to hear it. And speaking of applause and giving it up, uh, I want to I want to take a moment and, and acknowledge our sponsor, one of our sponsors for the evening, uh, Mr. Sean Collins back there with Affiliate Summit, who is in, who is responsible for the the delicious uh, alcoholic beverages that you're consuming, uh, even the gluten free ones that we have. Um, so uh, thanks, Sean, and the sandwiches, delicious sandwiches. Thanks for. Yeah, look, he's he's pulling a van of white. Van of white, yes. Um, so, uh, Sean, the last couple of times I've mentioned, acknowledged the Affiliate Summit for doing this. Um, I've talked about how one of your biggest challenges was getting people to apply for the are they called scholarships? Yeah, the pay it forward scholarships. Pay it forward scholarships because uh, you have about fifty of these every time you do Affiliate Summit, which is twice a year. Uh, Affiliate Summit East and West usually in or in New York City and Vegas, and they sell out with over 6,000? Over 6,000 in Vegas, and over 5,000 Yeah, they've sold out every year for the last 14 years, and so it's a, a wonderful conference uh, for people from all over the world, and, uh, you know, he gives away 50 scholarships to go, is it a, is it a full access? Yeah, full pass, food, all the sessions, and everything. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, he just, all you have to do is 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 give give up like a you know a, a decent yeah a, a very short I think it's three hundred words for a little essay about like your biggest challenges so at bare minimum all you have to do with that and pretty much you're gonna qualify because you never even get fifty people submitting yeah so uh, yeah. yeah so <laughs> think Sean's just all about giving it's like. I'm giving you food and beer so that you like apply for my free scholarship so I can give you more food and beer in Vegas or New York City. So thanks, Sean. Appreciate you. All right, so I asked my dear friend uh, Mercer to come up here, who's one of our, I think you've spoken on the stage a couple times? Yeah. Um, to come up here and help me introduce our, introduce our, our special guest speaker for tonight. Um, by the way, my name is Dave Gonzalez, and I'm your your, your, your host tonight, I co coordinate and organize this thing. It's actually a lot of fun, it's pretty easy, and I wouldn't be able to do it as easily or funly, is that a word? If it weren't for my assistant over here, Wyo Benavides. Let's give it up for Wyo. Thanks for and the other thing is, is I don't know, thanks Wyo, thanks everybody. I, I don't know if you ever uh, guys have the experience of uh, putting on an event or doing some project, some initiative, where you're, you're helping other people have a better experience and then somebody pops their head out and they're like, hey, if, if I can help in any way, if I can you know, be of service, like, just let me know. And 
you know, when somebody does that, like some, you know, I think at least eighty percent of the time they're just they're just saying it, but then when you call them on it, they don't <laughs> they don't pull through. Well, I want to acknowledge Marcus back there. Uh, Marcus, what's tell me your last name? Mark, Marcus Jordan, who a couple of weeks ago, like about the three months ago, poked his head out and said, hey man, there's anything I can do to support, love what you're doing, and um, Wyo called him on it, and he, like, a couple of months ago, I, like, I was I rushed, and, and we said, what we need is some ice chests filled with ice, and Marcus just, he couldn't make it that evening, and he delivered a couple of brand new ice chests filled with ice, like big, awesome ice chests, too. And so I was like, man, that's like, who does that? And I was like, how can I help you? And he's like, I don't need anything. I just love what you're doing and wanted technology. So I think when people go out of their way to just do a good deed for the sake of doing it, like they deserve to be acknowledged. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> and he didn't ask for that. And like, I just think like if the world was filled with more Marcuses, everything would be way better. So thanks for being a good example of how to be. Um, <clears throat> so speaking of good examples of how to be, this dude right here, I asked him a little while ago, I was like, look, I have known Pep, and that's Pep or not, it's, his name is not Pete, it's spelled Pete, but he, he doesn't like when you call him that, so it's Pep, all right? <laughs> and then Laya is the way you say his last name. It's not Laja, he's from Estonia. And so they pronounce things different. And so I've known Pep for about seven and a half years. I run another meetup group called the Internet Marketing Party. And about seven years ago, this dude showed up and uh, it said Pep on his thing and I thought it was Peep. <laughs> but he was really really cool. And, and he was with another dude who's a guy named uh, Nathan Hopkins. They were hanging out. And Nathan is now the marketing director at a company called Biotrust that is about $160 million a year. And uh, they're just like, and now, seven, fast forward seven years, and I saw this video of them, and they both look seven years younger and seven years less um, mature. Like, they just had that, like, starry-eyed look in their eyes. It was cool, and I watched it, and it's like, look at where they've come. And, you know, was, it was, you know how sometimes when you know someone, when they're coming up, like, you, it takes you a while to realize, oh, they're kind of a big deal now. <laughs> and I remember one day, uh, we were thinking about who to have as a guest speaker at Internet Marketing Party, and, and Mercer said, oh, we should invite Pep. And I was like, Pep, Pep, oh yeah, what's he doing? Doesn't he have like some conversion blog or something? He goes, dude, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pep's kind of a big deal now. <laughs> and then he reached out to me a couple years ago. He goes, yeah, I think I'm gonna start my own conference, and, and uh, but I'm gonna do it out like in, like, like drippy, is, where is it, the Horseshoe Bay, like an hour outside of Austin, and I was like, <laughs> And like, cause I didn't know how big of a deal he was already. And like, next thing you know, you have people flying in from all around the world to come to this thing. And he like, just goes off without a hitch. And then here he like, a, and then I found out he's doing one in Estonia. So he's like now leading international, you know, to, over the, uh, overseas conferences and doing really well with that. And he's got a, like an industry leading blog. And, and, and like, that's where people go to learn about conversions. Like all the best CROs in the world, like, they read his blog and they come to his conferences, whether it's here or in Estonia. And I asked Mercer to come up here because I was like, dude, I want to make sure I make him look and sound as amazing as he is. Because otherwise I'll just say, oh, he's a dude that came to my internet marketing party about seven years ago and you should check him out. Like, that's not really doing it justice. So anything, did, did I just take everything you said and said it verbatim? I just wanted you as my crush. Just, just so you know, like my prep for this was like, oh, we're going to have a conversation. I'm like, cool, I'll talk about this, this, and this. And then, you know, what his name is and how to say it and about Conversion Excel and about the conference and where it is. And I'm like, just ticking off everything. So um, I, I, will, I will also say that we can bring Pep up too. The, 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 um, to say that he's uh, a titan in the industry is not uh, a misstatement. It's important that you understand who is in this room. He leads the industry. There are people, uh, and I'm one of them, you know, we're, there's a lot of us that are in this business. We all follow his blog. We follow Conversion Excel. Uh, he's dedicated to the truth. He's blunt as hell, which I love. Um, and he knows his shit. Like, he really does. Like, this guy focuses on it, and he makes sure everybody on his team focuses on it. Uh, and besides Conversion Excel, there's Conversion Excel Live, which I attend every year. It's one of our go-to conferences. It's the one that Dave was talking about from Shubay. 
Uh, he has the other one, obviously, in Estonia, um, which is a little further of a commute for some of us. Um, <laughs> but, but definitely hit Converse Excel Live for sure. And uh, Converse Excel Institute, which I don't know if you'll talk about or not, but that's uh, a new endeavor, which I want to make sure you guys knew about. Because Converse Excel Institute is where he's taking all of this research that he does already, all this academic research that's you know, just written really for professors to talk about how they should keep their job, right? And they're doing all these cool little studies. But it's not accessible to people on, in the front lines. And he takes that, they go through it, and he's got a whole team that goes through that and makes this stuff accessible. Here's the latest learnings, and here's why you should apply it. You know, how to actually split test it, make sure your data's sound, so that when you're out there improving your site, you're doing it with a process that makes sense and will give you replicatable results. So um, <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. I was going to, you know, thank you, Pep, because I've, I've known you for years and I've learned a ton from you. And I've taken this conversion course from, you know, what, three years ago when you first launched it. And, uh, and it's launched us. Like, it's been, it's been an amazing experience. So thank you for that. And uh, I guess without further ado, Pat Playa. Come on up. See why I wanted to her up here? I don't need a mic. I will love my eyes. All right. So yes, guys, my name is a scientific experiment <laughs> to figure out what people trust more, what they hear or what they read. And it goes like this. I meet somebody and say, hey, my name is Pei Playa. Here's my card. They look at my card, and then they read, P Playa. <laughs> I just told you what my name is or how to pronounce it. So yes, people, uh, people believe their eyes way more than ears. So I'm a conversion optimization guy. I run a lot of tests. How many of you consider yourself as a conversion optimization person? All right, cool, three and a half hands. <laughs> How many of you are running A-B tests? Huh? A little more, nice. The rest of you, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> it's gonna be completely irrelevant for you. Maybe, well, let's see. So, so what is it that we're doing here when it comes to conversion optimization? Any guess? Do we have a guess? What is conversion optimization? What is the goal of conversion optimization? What are we trying to do? Make more money. More Make more money. That is the correct answer, yes. <laughs> so let's imagine that this is our growth <coughs> curve. So we've been around since whatever, 2007, and you know, like, we're alive, we're not dying, but things are not great. So what if everything else would remain the same? But the only things that would change about our business is that we would be able to increase our conversion rate by just 10% per year. Ooh. So meaning convert 10% more visitors into buyers, um, leads, whatever the goal is. Our growth curve would change like that. Well, how about going from 10 to 15%? That's your growth curve. That's the magic of conversion optimization. If you had started years ago in 2009 with 15% improvement every year, that's what your growth, that's when you show this to an investor, that's when you raise money. That's when you want to come to Capital Factory. And of course, if you were around in year 2009, you might be thinking, oh, yeah. Anyway, so optimization is compound interest for growth. You know, you don't need to buy more traffic, just convert whoever is on your website now, and you will grow. And of course, if you add here more traffic, you'll grow even faster. So, bad news for you guys. Bad news for you. You're all fired. <laughs> but there's some good news too. Some idiot just hired you. And your new job title is the conversion optimization director for this travel website. And your job is to improve the conversion rate 30% per year. Now, how do you do it? You know you need to improve the website by 30, uh, conversion rate by 30%. How do you go about it? Let's say we look at the website. You know, if you first think, oh, I mean, I don't know, like I would like change this and that, remove this, add something. That's completely wrong. That's all. If, if you start thinking in terms of tactics, you don't know what you're doing. So, what about Google? We all know Google, hey, conversion optimization tactics, techniques, and all that stuff. We find lots and lots of blog posts, like this one, conversion rate optimization techniques, the complete list. Oh my God, everything is in here. 
I can just, just copy all these tactics and conversions through the roof, right? And they say, oh, you can easily sort through 100 plus <coughs> techniques. This is the best day in our, of our lives, right? Well, we're gonna nail that 30% goal. But then, so 100 tactics, so how do we use this? Do we like implement them like all at once or, or what do we do with them? Yeah, let's go for all at once, yeah. And then your website will look like this. <laughs> of course, Link's cars, this is, you know, I, I, I brought it up as a negative example in one of the conferences. And then the, the owner of this website, Ling, <laughs> destroyed me on Twitter. <laughs> this company makes 30 million pounds per year. This is a highly successful company. Why? Because it looks like this. Because that's their whole shtick, you know, like over, you know, just crazy. And she's crazy in person too. But if you guys do this, of course, you'll fail. She's the only one who can pull it off. <laughs> anyway, so yes, if we imp implement 100 tactics all at once, some will work, some will not work, our website will look like a Christmas tree, and so those tactics will cancel each other out, and we don't know what worked, really. So that's not the way to go. Hey, but what about A-B testing? Let's A-B test these 100 tactics one by one, and then we know which one works and which one doesn't work. So an average A-B test on an average website runs like four weeks. So it will take us, what, like seven and a half years. <laughs> yeah, we don't have that kind of time to optimize anything. So, so, testing, so if you find a blog post with 100 tactics, what is the value of that blog post? Not much, not much. Oh, hey, what about this checklist? I found it on moz.com, must be good. 91 point checklist. Tick every box, maximum conversions achieved. Well, again, we live in the real world. Sorry, guys. Not true, not true. What about best practices? There's a best practice for everything. The <coughs> optimal homepage, the optimal whatever form page, optimal landing page. Hell, there are five best practices for every layout you can imagine. So can we just do that? Yes, we can. However. A best practice is where you start, not where you end up. It's a starting point. It's not optimization. You should meet the levels of a best practice and then evolve from that. And most best practices are actually common practices. Not best, it's just everybody is using them, so we assume this is the best way to go. Not true. What about latest design trends? You've seen these ghost buttons, you're like buttons with nothing inside. So like we want people to click on this button and we make it less visible. Good idea. Yeah, yeah, design trends. Or what about video backgrounds? Every cool site has one, right? So, well, people are on your website. They're trying to understand where is this website? What can I do here? Why should I do it? But they're not reading it because they're seeing this guy shaking his ass or whatever is happening. Video backgrounds is a distraction. They're not understanding your value proposition and what you're saying. Executives love it. They say, oh my God, we need to have one of these. But uh, it's going to kill your sets. But what about copying market leaders? <laughs> Amazon's doing pretty fine. Do you know the conversion rate for Amazon Prime subscribers? It's 74%. 74% of people who go to Amazon who are Prime members buy some. So what's your conversion rate on your website? Maybe it's 5%, 5% is pretty good. So that's a 15 times difference. Now ask yourself, is the design of Amazon 15 times better than your design? Is their copy 15 times better than your copy? No, their success is not based on the design and the copy. So if you copy their website, their, their design and what they do, and you expect to get Amazon style results, you're an idiot, I'm sorry. Does, the world does not work like that. Market leaders are successful because they execute well across all the, you know, whatever business things. The whole customer experience is amazing and it has been so for many years. They didn't start off with 74% conversion rate. On, and what about competitors? Oh, our competitor is doing this. We need to be doing this too. 
They must have tested it. Well, they probably didn't. <laughs> they probably either copied it from another website, who copied it from another website, who copied it from another website, or the CEO said, hey, I read this great blog post with 100 tactics. We're going to do this. And there you go. So that's why your competitor is doing stuff. Not because they figured something out that really works. They probably, they're probably as clueless as you are. And I'm saying that with lots of affection. So, so then, how do we go about improving conversions? It seems to be a difficult thing. Well, we need a process. And we need a process that's repeatable, and it's industry agnostic, and it's something that works across every single website in the world, where we have a website that needs its conversion rate improved. We come in, we apply this process on this website, and we make more money. And this guy, William Deming, he said, He's the father of the Industrial Revolution in the 60s, you know, like when Japan started making cars and the Sony made, making you know, TVs and they took over the whole world. This guy was behind this. So he, in, back in the 60s, said that if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. So imagine you hire, tomorrow you hire a new person to do your job. Can you describe them within 10 minutes how to do your job? Do you have a process for doing it? Or is it random list of 1,000 facts that you have to remember. If that's the true, you don't know what you're doing. It needs to be systematized, at least if you want to grow. So process, we need a process. So how do we optimize optimization programs within companies? Well, first of all, we need metrics. We need to be able to measure how our optimization program is doing. So metric number one is how many <coughs> experiments are we running? How many experiments, how many tests are we running? Our experimentation velocity. Number two is how many of those experiments, of those tests, end up giving us a win, more money? What the percentage of winning tests, win rate. And number three is the uplift per successful experiment. So we, we run a test, and do we make, do we increase our conversion rate by 5%, 10%, 25%? What's the average uplift per successful experiment? So those are our three metrics to measure our optimization program. Uh, and the most important thing about any optimization program to make sure that those three things, well, the number one thing, the running as many experiments as you can is about you know, how, how much traffic you have and your implementation abilities if your developers are like agile and shit. But the, the two other things, winning more tests and having lots of uplifts per test. It's all about testing the right stuff or change, making effective changes on your website. And this all comes all down to figuring out what actually matters. So our goal is to either make or test effective changes on a website, things that will make us more money. So how do we know which changes will make us more money? We will figure this out by figuring out what matters. What matters to our users when they're shopping for whatever we're selling? Services, products, doesn't matter. How are they approaching this pro uh, problem? Uh, what is the number one criteria? Maybe it's price, maybe it's something else. What's second, third, and so on? And you probably have multiple buyer type personas, if you will. So what matters to them? And then your website. What's the discrepancy between what, how users want to buy and what your website says and offers? And and different elements on your page. Imagine, look, think about your homepage of your website. You have certain content there. So I have the content blocks, the image, maybe video, some whatever stuff in there. And it's in some order. Why is it in that order? Do you know which of those elements is actually contributing to more sales and more money and which is actually lowering sales or which makes no difference that you should get rid of? If you don't know that, then you know, your website is completely random. You know, how can you expect to make any money if it's completely random junk that you just threw together? We need to figure out what actually matters. Which parts of our website actually matter. And let me tell you how to do it. So we need to start thinking about our website as a list of problems. Our website is a bunch of problems. And we need to figure out what the problems are, where they are, and why these problems are problems. Because we can only make effective changes if we know what the problem is that we should solve. We might not, we might identify <coughs> what the problem is, but we still don't know what the right solution is. That's why we, we run A-B tests. But in order to figure out what works, we 
we, what makes a difference, what matters? Two things. One, we test. We test something, if it wins, oh, this thing matters. If it loses, maybe it doesn't matter. Or maybe the, the specific implementation that you tested was just a stupid idea, also possible. But if we start with testing to figure out, I wonder if this matters, let's test it. If you start with this, then it's the same problem with the 100 random blog posts, uh, items in a blog post. You have no way to prioritize. You don't know where to begin. So you should not start with testing. You should start with research. Research into what actually matters. And in order to do research, we need what? Data, yes. But you don't want to be this douchebag. We don't need more data. We need better data. We need data that we can actually use. So if, I'm, if my task is to cross the road and there are cars going here, I could have the perfect data in the world, you know, like the angle of the <coughs> sun rays and the air humidity and how many clouds are in the sky and how many people are next to me. I could have all this data. I'm like, I would even maybe know this guy's name next to me. That's data, right? But the only data that matters is that, is there a car coming and how fast? <laughs> Nothing else is important. So it's the same with our websites. We have to figure out actually what is the data that is actually important to us. So, because we, if we have too much data, we have analysis paralysis. And it's, you know, oh, we need to be data driven, right? What does data driven mean? It's like, oh, let's log into Google Analytics and see what the data says. Well, the data doesn't tell you shit. Data is just there, it's passive. It is up to us. Oh, of course, everything data driven is actually human, people driven. It is us, we, the humans, that I need to get, decide what kind of data we need, and then we need to figure out what this data means, like pull insights out of the data, make some conclusions out of the data, because there is no tool in the world that tells you that, oh, this data means this. And we're talking about small data. Big data has different kinds of um, um, different, uh, you, you apply it in different places. And for conversion optimization, this is not a big data thing. So yes, we need a bunch of data. So it all starts with asking questions. What is it that we want to know? And first we establish the business questions and then we gather the data that might help us answer those questions. And now the only data we have is the data that helps us answer the questions that we wanted to find answers to. We don't have anything else. We don't have the angle of the sun rays. Right. So one of these questions, of course, these are highly, highly um, specific to your business, to your industry, to your business challenges. However, of course, there are some universal questions such as this ones. I can send you the slides later. David has that in D list. We'll send, I'll send you a PDF later so you don't need to write this stuff down. Um, but yeah, we need to figure out who these people are, what they do, what they don't do, you know, and what's the impact of everything they do. Right. But if you torture data long enough, it will confess to anything. We have to be aware that we human beings are very biased. We, if we want something to be true, we can make the data tell us that our opinion is right. Like, so it's like, ah, we're so smart. We prove that we're right. And that's such a sad loss for the humanity because this is not about egos. This is about what actually is true. I want to be completely wrong about everything as long as I find out what's actually the truth. And then based on the truth, I can optimize the website. So it's not about egos. It is about what are the actual changes I can make to make more money. So I, I, I fight this fight with executives all the damn time. Whereas like stuff on their homepage, you know, the precious real estate. <laughs> An example comes to mind. So we're testing. Uh, uh, we're, we're testing hero images, the photography on their homepage, e-commerce site. And uh, we have a, a winning doctor image there. It's like, because their old brand is about doctors and uh, trust and all that stuff. And, then, and so we have an image that we tested, it works really well. I said, I don't want this image anymore. I want a different kind of doctor. So like, what do you mean different kind of doctor? Well, let's just say that uh, we, uh, we need a female. It's like, oh my God, what a douchebag. And uh, trying to argue with like rational arguments 
But no, it's just it's like, no, I'm the CEO. This is what goes. So I'm, I'm sure you guys have this experience this on a daily basis in your office where somebody just likes their opinions too much and they're probably a sexist asshole as well. So process. This is the framework that I came up with many years ago. I call it Research Excel. If you Google it, there's a blog post and there's a whole free course about it, how to apply it and use it. And I'll just give you a quick overview of how, to, how do you use this process to figure out what matters so you can make lots of money. And essentially what we're doing with this process is that we're using six types of data inputs to gather data, which is a reasonable amount of data that we can process and make sense <coughs> of so we can figure out what are the problems with a website and we can fix it and improve our conversion rate or revenue per visitor, whatever we want to do. So step number one in this process is, is that we need to figure out where are we losing money because of technical issues. And you think your front-end developers did a good job? Maybe, but I wouldn't be so sure. Uh, we want to we wanna find underperforming browser segments. So let's say that Look at inter uh, conversion rate per browser. So let's say conversion rate per Internet Explorer. And we, convert, uh, we compare the conversion rate. You can do it easily in Google Analytics. Conversion rate of Internet Explorer 9 users versus 11 users. And let's say uh, Explorer 11 users converted 5%, but ele and, uh, Explorer 9 is at 2%. Ooh, there's more than two times difference here. That's probably because of some bugs. Might not be, but it probably is. If you fix those bugs, instantly more money instantly more money. And same with uh, mobile devices. Some devices perform way lower than other devices. Probably some UX issues, some bugs, and so on. You can have the most persuasive website in the world, but if it doesn't work properly in the specific device and or browser I'm on, it doesn't mean anything. And same goes for site speed. Site speed is not that important, uh, unless your site is like, you know, takes 30 seconds to load, <coughs> that's horrible. But if you're like, Within the five second realm, I mean, you're not gonna get any massive speed, uh, revenue gains from getting faster. The studies that you read online about how like, any, every millisecond is like, I don't know how much more money. I've never seen that in my life, never, <laughs> never. I think it's, it's a myth propagated by some companies who somehow make more money by telling it this bullshit, anyway. So I taught this guy from Sweden, this process, how to do quality assurance. And he said, he, in 10 minutes in Google Analytics, he found a bug in a Safari browser. So the, his, his mobile users on Safari were converting two times less. It takes, took him 10 minutes to find this bug. It affected 32,000 users per week uh, and instantly more money. We don't need to use any magic persuasion stuff. Pew, money in the pocket, right? So after we take care of all the bugs and all that technical stuff, next step is heuristic analysis. So heuristic analysis is, is, is an experience-based assessment of our website. So essentially what we're doing is we're walking through our website, our funnel, page by page, uh, first on desktop, then tablet, then mobile, so separate uh, device categories, we keep them separate, and we evaluate every single page for a certain set of criteria, like relevancy, uh, if I came from an uh, external link, a banner, a link in an email, a uh, Google AdWords ad, whatever, is there a message match? Like I, the ad said, same day flower delivery in Austin, I click on the ad, and if it does not say those things on the page, there's a message mismatch, the conversion rate tanks, so relevancy. Clarity, do I understand what is this site about? What can I do here? Why should I do it? Why should I use this site instead of all these other sites? Clarity, super important. And motivation, every single page in a website should have just one goal. We want users to click on this button on this page. <coughs> now, you can have secondary goals, but one primary goal. And now you ask yourself, you, whenever you serve this call to action to people, hey, click this button, dear sir, you, all, you have to ask yourself, how high is their motivation to click that button or put that form in front of them before you do that? Because if it's not very high, they're not going to do it. So don't put the damn button there. Increase their motivation instead. And, and friction, like what is hindering people? What is, what is keeping people from taking this action? And I think I have some examples here. So square. So the clarity. Let's assess clarity here. Start accepting credit cards today. Okay, I understand what they do. 
Sign up, we'll mail you a free square reader. Okay, I understand what the form is for. 2.75% per swipe. Okay, that's clear. And the photo shows me how to use this product. So the photo supports the clarity of the value proposition. This is as clear as it gets. Can't be any clearer. And so there are a bunch of companies who will put their like a picture of a random uh, laptop with a coffee mug there, like every startup, right? Uh, so, so like you, your photos need to be there to support the clarity of your value proposition. So I would understand what you guys do here. Uh, so this guy has really, really nailed this uh, clarity stuff. Which of these circles is the most important circle? What do you think? <coughs> the big one. The big one, of course it's the big one. We don't need to know these circles to know that the big one is the boss. Of course, that's the way life works. Uh, so, if we know what we want users to do on any page on a website, is that thing the most prominent thing on your page? Or is it not? Is it out one out of 20 things? So visual hierarchy is not just about size, you know, real estate. It's also about color. So these buttons are the same size. One stands out more because of color, obviously. So here's a most famous uh, color A-B test ever run where red button converted better than green button. And why was that? Not because red is a magical color, but because red stands out better. Because you know, there's a lot of green in this uh, layout, so red stands out better. It's higher up in the visual hierarchy, hence more clicks. So, and now we get to the motivation. So a really useful framework uh, or model to think about is this bold behavior model. He's a researcher at Stanford University. Behavior design is his thing. So basically, the theory says that behavior occurs when three things converge. High motivation, I want to do this. Peak ability, it's easy to do it. And there's a trigger that asks us to take action. So if I would tell you, do you want a free Tesla Model S P85D? Yes. And now I say, just fill out these 100 form fields. You'll still do it, because the motivation is so high, right? So it's, a, it's it, every, every behavior is, is, a, is, a, is a match between these two. But of course, what you're selling in your company is not a free Tesla. So you <coughs> can't put 100 form fields in front of them. I can't. <laughs> I'm not saying free Tesla. But so, so you understand, so motivation and friction, the ability to do stuff. So if you put a trigger on somebody's path, click this button, fill out this form, whatever, is there, if their motivation is not high and their ability is not at their peak, they're not gonna do it. So don't ask them to take action until they're ready. So in this page, it's a landing page, they want us to click this red button that says free product tour. How easy is it? for us to click this button. Well, it's big. It's, it has a unique, distinct color red. It stands out, it's high in the visual hierarchy. It's easy to find this button and click on it, no problem. Click on this button, now they want, to, they want us to fill out this form. Oh, but now there are all kinds of problems. First of all, this form is below the phone, so we need to scroll down to get to it. It has a bunch of form fields, which we don't want to fill out. It has, every single field is mandatory, bad. And uh, the, the form field labels are left aligned, so far from the field. So we can't even understand which label goes to which field. So usability problems. So now the ability goes way down. But even before we want to click that button, before we, we click this button, we have to ask ourselves, do we want to click this button? Right? And we probably don't, because this site is shit. <laughs> And so this is an exercise to do inside your company. Like, do, do people really want to do this action that we want them to do? Or what about this pop-up here? Oh, they want us to uh, you know, fill out, uh, put in our email. Well, let's talk about ability first. They have two fields for the email. Email, please confirm your email. Well, why two fields? We know our email. Get rid of one field, ability. <coughs> okay, so what about motivation? Be the first to hear about new arrivals. This is a, the lamest offer you can give somebody. Be the, and it's a lie. You're not the first. Everybody on their email list finds out at the same time. And how, how often do you meet people? Hey, what are your goals in life? Oh, man, I just want to be the first to hear about gaps next thing. <laughs> like, nobody. 
no, but that doesn't happen. This is a marketer in their office, never leaving their cubicles, thinking, oh my god, this is great stuff. So no. But look at, look at, look at this fine print here. You probably can't see it, but it says, oh, and by the way, you get a 25% off coupon code too. <laughs> That's money in the pocket. That's what I want if I want to buy a gap. Yeah, 25% off. Why don't you lead with that? Motivation goes up, higher conversion rate, right? <clears throat> This page also wants us to join their newsletter. Uh, it's very difficult to join the newsletter because we need to give all this data, and this is just the top, upper half of the page. And what are they doing on the, for, the, for our motivation? Nothing. <laughs> but this is real world. This is a huge company. This is a client of mine. <laughs> they changed it after two years. Uh, so, and then we, we, we go page by page, and we use, I, I like to use some sort of a, like a group annotation tool. You know, there are hundreds around. This is done in uh, Google, um, Google Docs presentations. So just add comments and stuff that we see. Uh, so this is how we mark, this is how we do heuristic analysis. Like basically, assess, you know, this is a way down in the visual hierarchy. This is what the hotel is. Oh, leading with price, you know, makes people think about cost because we're not, we haven't told anything about value yet, and so on and so forth. And, and um, so we, we make these observations based on clarity, relevancy, motivation, friction, page by page. And in the end, we have a list of things that we think are problems. And it's very important to understand that that, that list is not a list of problems. It's a list of things that we think are problems. I call it areas of interest. And now we need to gather qualitative and quantitative data to validate and or invalidate these observations to make sure that we're not the only one thinking that this is a problem because we might be. Uh, oh, going the other way. All right, so essentially we're asking what's wrong with this picture when we're looking at a page on our own website? What's wrong with this picture? This is the standard police training, by the way. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with the dogs? <laughs> Damn dogs, you never appreciate good things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so digital analysis. So next step, so we have a bunch of shit that we, we think are problems. We have identified, we have a list of problems. So we go to digital analytics. It doesn't matter if you use Google Analytics, Omniture, Heap Analytics, uh, you know, what have you. It doesn't matter, it's all good. It's all good. So main things for our purpose, digital analytics is of course an eight hour workshop that you know, maybe Gonzalez hires me to do one day. But for <coughs> our purposes, we want to understand where are the leaks? Where is money pouring out when people are on a website? Every single page on a website is leaking money or visitors, visitors are dropping out. But where is the leak the biggest? Where are they dropping out the most? So we can understand where are the biggest holes where to start first? Or which segments of our users are leaking the most? Maybe it's people who come from Pinterest, maybe it's uh, mobile users, maybe it's uh, people from Austin uh, who use Safari mobile browsers. Who knows? We need to figure out which segments are underperforming severely and figure out why, or why some are overperforming, or like performing really well. And which actions correlate with more purchases? So people can do all kinds of things on a website, like click here, click there, read this page, maybe there's a widget they can interact with, put in some numbers in a form. We need to be measuring and tracking everything they do on a website, because we need to understand that, oh, if they visit these three pages in a row, their likelihood of converting or buying something goes up three times. Holy shit, that's great. How can we funnel everybody on a website to visit these three pages in a row, so we triple our sales. Or people who, who convert two times more interact with this widget over here, or they do use, use this tool over here. So the, the bottom line is that you need to be measuring every single thing that users can do on your website. 90% of the websites that I've seen don't. You think you put analytics script on your website, you're in the money? No. You're just measuring basic shit. All the good stuff, you need to hire Mercer to set that thing, uh, thing up for you. Uh, so yeah, if you need, uh, if you need, you need to measure everything. And if you don't know how to set it up, you need to hire an analytics implementation guy who will help you. Or if you have an in-house 
developer, Google Tag Manager is a great tool, Heap Analytics, Amplitude Analytics, good tools that measure everything automatically, everything, everything that happens in the DOM, uh, every, every click, every hover, every scroll is being recorded. Uh, so you need to get this stuff done. So here's a site, and uh, this guy has hired us to redesign our website. This is the redesigned version. That eventually this guy was replaced with, with a female. Uh, uh, and so what we, we, what we realized doing qualitative <coughs> research for this website was that we under, this is, they sell allergy relief products. Allergy relief products. So, you know, like if you have uh, dust allergies or whatever. So in, in qualitative research told us that we wanted to understand how, how are people shopping for these products. And we understood that the, when they come to this website, the first thing they ask is, I need, the re I need relief for the specific allergy condition that I have. So that, that's how they start. So we designed this widget here, this drop down thing, uh, where they can choose their specific condition. So we built it, but we don't know if anybody's using it, or if they are using it, what's the impact on their behavior? But analytics tells us. So we set up an, a, a segment, people who use this feature versus everybody else. And we saw that the people who use this feature convert four times better than your average user. Whoa, that's crazy. But only 10% of people use this feature. So cause or correlation, we don't know. But the hypothesis is that if 10% of people use this feature right now, what if we could get 20% of people to use this feature? Would we make more money? I want to know. I want to figure out. And so we designed, uh, devised, uh, designed an ex experiment. So using visual hierarchy, we made the thing orange so it stands out better. Run an A-B test and wah, wah, wah. No lift in sales. So what's wrong? Was our hypothesis incorrect? That uh, our data analysis was all messed up? Uh, so we looked at the data and actually the number of people using this feature did not change, still 10%. And the conversion rate for the people who use this feature is still great. So it's only everybody else who were bothered by it somehow. So the whole, every time you, need, you, you identify a problem or a correlation that you want to pursue, you ask yourself how many different ways are there to design an experiment to get people to do something. Let's say we have a checkout page. Survey, we survey website visitors and they tell us, we are worried about security on this page. So we know that we need to improve the perception of security on that checkout page. Now, how many ways are there for us to improve the perception of security on, on, on a given checkout page? How many different ways are there? Infinite, unlimited. So if you run one A-B test, you test one possible solution and it doesn't work, doesn't mean that your idea is wrong. It means that your, your idea of what solves this problem was wrong. So never confuse those two things. So we designed the thing like this, and we designed the thing like this, and this one made us 5% more money. And now the website is the female. Yeah. Uh, okay, so mouse tracking. Mouse tracking. Uh, there are tools like Hotjar, there are tools like uh, Clicktail, uh, Full Story, lots and lots of tools. Absolutely. no. They don't do this. They're only for blog posts, but this is this is more sophisticated than that. Uh, so basically, we can see everywhere that people click, where they hover with their mouse, how far down they scroll on the page. Uh, we can watch videos of people going through our website and see what they do on our website. We, we find in Google Analytics, we find a page that's leaking a lot of money. 80% of visitors drop out in funnel step two. Wow, I don't know. Oh, we can watch videos of people on that step and see what they do and figure this stuff out. So where people hover with their mouse, you know, this attention heat maps, completely useless. So, because there's no correlation between where the mouse cursor moves and where people look. Because have you ever, ever read a blog post online? Did you go with your mouse like? <laughs> no, no you didn't, yeah, so that's why it's bullshit. Uh, click maps. This shows you the aggregated heat maps. Did, do I have a picture of heat map? I don't. Sorry, guys. Um, but anyways, this, this, this stuff is good where people click and tell you, you know, 
if they're clicking on stuff, there's actually another button that looks like a button. But the, the most useful is how far down people scroll on a given page. Because if, 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 if a key information that's is there to increase user motivation to take action, but people don't read it because they don't scroll down, you know you have a problem. You have a motivation problem because people don't scroll. So you need to move a bunch of your stuff above the fold where people see it more. You need to, of course, tweak your design because in, in modern design, you see a lot of these things in UX, it's called false bottoms, where it's like you have different content blocks. And this is with white background, this is an image background black background, blue background. And every time there's this line and the black background, background color change, people, some people think that, oh, this is where the website ends, or everything that follows is a banner, or uh, irrelevant content, unrelated to the stuff above, and they just stop scrolling. And so you, when looking at the scroll map, you can, you can see this drop-off points, and it usually correlates with these lines or background color changes. Very useful stuff. And session replays, yeah, watch videos, really, really fucking useful. And if you have forms on your website, you put form analytics and which form field in your form is causing people to drop out? Do you know if you have forms on your website? If you don't know, how, do you, how can you optimize your form? Because you're just completely in the dark. Form analytics. Hotjar has them, Formissimo has them, uh, VWO has them built in. Uh, qualitative service. So all this quantitative do analytics, heat maps, tell us what is happening, where is it happening, and how much. Qualitative tells us why. It comes from the audience, from the users. So we want to do two types of surveys. We want to survey people who just bought from us, from our e-commerce store, people who just signed up for our SaaS free trial, people who just requested their quote, all, this, all these people. We want to email them within, within one week while they're still freshly remembering their purchasing or your, your website experience. And you want to send them a s survey through e over email. Well, calling is better, but it's not scalable. So you send them a survey, and you ask them only open-ended questions. No yes and no's. No, how would you rate your experience from 0 to 10? Well, let's say you ask them, how was your experience from 0 to 10? And they say, 4. Then what do you do with that information? Fuck all. It's like, oh, well, the uh, experience sucks, but I have no idea what to do. What's the problem? No clue. You know. <laughs> so forget multi the only time to use multiple choices in this survey is that if you want to segment people. Are you a man or a woman? What's your age? Where do you live? If, that, if you have different buyer types, if you have different buyer groups and you want to segment the answers based on some criteria, that's the only use case. If you, if you want to know what the problem was, it's not like, please select one of these, the following five problems that you might have had. Because this also assumes that you already know what the problems were. Yeah, you, you, you probably know. So <coughs> you ask them questions about friction <coughs> in the process. You ask them, what's the one thing that nearly stopped you from buying? What are the doubts and hesitations you had before completing the purchase? What kind of questions you had you couldn't find answers to? Uh, what kind of problem were you solving for yourself when buying this product? Of course, you know, the questions are, of course, contextual. If you're buying pants, I don't need to ask what kind of problem were you solving for yourself. A lack of pants. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes it's very important to know. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so it might look like this. This is Google Docs survey, completely free, good enough. Typeform is the most beautiful one. If you know more complex surveys, <coughs> survey gizmo is, uh, is pretty good, great. And the second type of, oh, and then in the end you have the questions. So what's the one thing that nearly stopped you from buying? You want to get about 250 responses, 200, 250. 100 is also good, less than 100. Well, one is better than none. So, so people, people uh, give answers to these questions, all kinds of different answers. And, but usually what you see is that there are, even if you have 250 responses to a question, there are like four or five types of answers. So you categorize, oh, this answer was about cost, this was about shipping fees, this was about delivery times, this was like, my caller is unavailable, I'm not sure if I like it. And then you count how many times each issue came up, and then you understand you know, relative frequency of a possible problem. And then another type of survey you want to do is that you have a page that's performing poorly. This is an actual page we worked on with my coaching class. And uh, this page had only 30% of people clicked on secure checkout or PayPal, 30%. So 
70% dropped out. Why? Just looking at the page like, hmm, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, I don't know. So we put a poll on this website asking them, what's holding you back from completing this purchase right now? And people gave us answers. You usually get a 2 to 4% response rate, not very high. If you let it run, depending on your traffic, you know, it takes, might take a while, might take a half an hour if you're booking.com. Is that just price shopping? Other people do very of course, absolutely, price and price it's also price. important for us to know that, that that's the problem. So in this case, with the survey, word cloud, any idea what the problem might have been? <laughs> shipping costs, shipping costs were the problem, and true, they were very high, but imagine us just looking at this page, ooh, what could be the problem? Ooh. Us, the damn people, they'll tell you, yes, shipping costs. <coughs> Shipping, shipping was the problem. So they completely changed the shipping model uh, and the business took off. And then finally, step number six is user testing. So we recruit people from our actual target audience. And if you can't find them, anybody is better than nobody again, but ideally a target audience. And you bring them, you have a laptop and you have them sit at your laptop and you give them tasks to complete on, on your website or use services like usertesting.com. And you give them three types of tasks. One is you give them, uh, let's say it's an e-commerce site. So give them a gener generic task. Hey, uh, it's, you know, your birthday is probably coming up, hopefully. Find something you would like and see how they go about it. And have them comment everything out loud. And give them a specific task. Hey, I need dark jeans in size 34, under 50 bucks, uh, you know, by this brand. Because some of your buyers on the website are, have very specific requirements. And then you see how successful they are if they need to find very, something very, very specific and see what goes wrong. But don't believe what they say. Here's a video. I don't know if I'm going to show it, but uh, so basically, this is I'm watching a user testing video that I recorded. This is on a mobile phone. This guy, it just says the task is to check out these are the credit card details, blah, blah. blah. Uh, buy these pants that are all in his cart already. It's minute five out of the 13 minute session. It takes the guy seven minutes to check out because it's, it's so horrible. Uh, it's a horrible, horrible experience. So many usability problems. And after seven minutes of extreme suffering and I'm like pulling my hair out as I'm watching this video, post user test survey, what trust did you about this site? Nothing. If you had a magic wand, what would you change? Oh, maybe a more masculine background color. What do you like about the site? Oh, it was so easy to use. <laughs> what? <laughs> Were you there? <laughs> so, because these people are trying to please you, especially if they're there in person. Maybe even you're paying them money. They, they want you to be happy, right? So don't believe what they tell you, <laughs> only observe what they do. Only observe what they do and the difficulties they have. And once you go through this process, you know what your problems are, where they are, and you have a pretty good idea of how big these problems are. I like to categorize these problems, some are like instrumentation problems, like we're not measuring stuff correctly. The data is incorrect or the data is missing. It's an instrumentation issue. We need Google Tag Manager. Just do it. Obvious mistakes or problems, just fix them. Some things are like, it's an obvious problem, but we don't know what the obvious solution is, so we need to run some A-B tests, figure out which, which uh, solution works best. Some issues are hypothesized, meaning that we know what the problem is, but we don't even know what the solution might be. So we need to like gather a group of people and just brainstorm what the solution might be to this problem that we have identified. And some problems I investigate, which is like, uh, I think there's a problem with this thing, but I'm not sure. I don't have enough data. We need to do more digging. And then uh, <laughs> the order of things is like you, fo you focus on the big known obvious problem first. Fix those things first. Then once you fix the obvious problems, you want to move on to the more, let's say you have a, a SaaS sign up page. No usability problems, uh, no clarity problems. Everybody knows what's happening, but not enough people are signing up. Ooh, why don't we use some scarcity or urgency tactics here? Or why don't we try, I don't know, social logging, sign up at Google or LinkedIn? 
no data in the world will tell you to use any persuasion tactics or social logging. You just have to do it once you fix the, the known problems, obvious stuff. And finally, if the social logins and the, all the psychological creative stuff is not moving the needle, then maybe the whole page is just shit and you need to completely rethink the experience that your users are having on the website. Maybe that also means rethinking the whole website, you know, depending on what the problems are. If you hit the local maximum, it's, 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 it's an actual thing, local maximum. So, and, and I usually like to put every problem that we identify into a Google spreadsheet. So like one column is like, what is the problem? Category of the problem, why is this problem a problem? What to do about this problem? Like a general description. And, and, and a priority rating, like five star issue. We're bleeding a bunch of money right now. Fix it now. And like one star is like, oh, it's a minor usability issue. We'll, we'll get to it eventually. And so, uh, I was optimizing this site for uh, truck drivers. This one, this was the original uh, page, and the conversion rate was maybe 13%. They had to fill out this form and then <coughs> fill out this form, and behind the scenes there was like a five-step resume creation, like apply to become a truck driver essentially. And um, we came in, we, we noticed that uh, more than half the people were using it on their mobile phones, and the original page was not mobile responsive. Uh, okay, that's, that's good to know, so we, we did that, we did a mobile responsive design. We made it look better, more professional. We did qualitative research to figure out what makes truck drivers change jobs. Pay was number one thing, so we had a you know, uh, pay-focused title and all these bullet points here are all stuff that came out of qualitative research. We ran an A-B test on this stuff, and there was no fucking difference between these two. Like, what? This is obviously better. It's data driven and shit, man. <laughs> ah. So it's like, okay, okay. So back to the drawing board. So, so what went wrong? Is our data correct? Is, uh, is like, did we come up with wrong hypotheses? And then we concluded, but did we, <coughs> our conclusions about the data were accurate, but the solution was not accurate. First of all, these guys are driving their trucks while applying to jobs. <laughs> so like, it's like, uh, oh, you know, like my, my name, okay. It's like, don't wanna kill anybody here. And um, so we thought, okay, we have way too much content here. Way too much content here. We need to optimize that. And so also for, oh, it starts with a name and email. Oh, it's hard to type while you're driving this big truck. Let's start with some drop downs, so like get the people in, and then it's the psychological principle of commitment and consistency. If you already start doing something, you need to finish it, or you're like more likely to finish it. So we did a went from that to this, less copy, start with drop downs, and we got 80% more uh, job applications. So, s slight, very small changes from our initial hypothesis. But had we stopped at our first thing, client says, we paid you all this money and there's like nothing. You know, it happens all the time in the real world. So you, you just made it bigger. You made it bold, bigger, bolder. Yeah, we made the copy bigger and uh, slightly bigger and then and removed a bunch of crap. So, so people on the move. Yeah, it's uh, easier to read the stuff. It's actually easier to consume, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so this is a systematic, repeatable, teachable process. You can you know, hire people to, um, teach them how to do conversion optimization. And the whole conversion optimization process is always this. You start, number one, with research. Find out what actually matters. From the research, you build hypotheses as to what might fix these problems. You build treatments that you turn into A-B tests if you have enough traffic. If you don't, you just have to implement changes. You analyze results and over and over and over again. This optimization never uh, ends in this stuff, yes, it is difficult, and it requires lots of skill and practice. As with everything, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Uh, don't be afraid of it. This guy, Ronnie Coleman, was six times Mr. Olympia, and he said, yeah, like, everybody wants to be a bodybuilder, but nobody wants to lift no heavy ass shit. It's the same thing with conversion optimization. Everybody wants to win, but nobody wants to do the heavy ass conversion research that I was just telling you about. So three things I want you guys to remember from my talk. Think in terms of processes, not tactics. Forget about those Neil Patel stuffs. 
focus on the discovery of what actually matters, most important thing, and you need to do the heaviest lifting of all this stuff. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this week we launched Conversion Excel Institute. If you have ex very specific problems you're having, we have scientific data on what might help you. Uh, thank you so much. <coughs> I just want to say thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, I asked Pep if he'd be willing to stick around and ask for like, you know, 20, 15, 20 minutes or something and then and, uh, do some que question and answers. I was going to say Q&A and question and answers. Uh, does anybody have any anything they'd like? One, two, three, four. All right, so if, you're, if your questions are meaty enough, we'll probably have, that'll probably be well, at a fifth one. You know Pep, huh? Yeah, I saw. A, uh, so you're like our, you're our our our, our sh shill. Is that what it's called? You can ask a really like a really. Uh, yeah, I know it was long, and then it a conference. <coughs> oh, nice, nice. Well, let's start with yours. What's your question? What's your name? I'm Luis Amaro. So my question is, when you have clients and you're running, and you want to run multiple tests triggering the same goal, how do you either talk them out of it, or how do you give them data saying, hey, like this could potentially store and they're running they're running an experiment on checkout but they're also running one on the home page. What do you how do you tell them yeah. how to do that or how do you like mitigate the data for everybody? So it, it, there are cases where it might be okay. So it, it depends what we are testing. What was the question again? Could you repeat it? <laughs> the question was can we run more than once A B test at the same time on our website that measure the same final action like transactions, revenue, stuff like that. So it, it all depends on how much traffic overlap is there between those two tests, and how how, how much is the how, how different is the content of those tests? So content A, test A might be changing the navigation, and con test B might be um, you know credit, addressing credit card security <laughs> concerns. Mm -hmm. So then there's the intent of this test is very different. So you're probably fine running these tests at the same time. But if it's like two tests and they're both in the checkout flow, like one is checkout step one, the other one is checkout test two, you don't want to combine it because that gets messy. So you want to merge them into a multi-page experiment. And uh, talking to executives, and it's only education. Education is the key. Just making them feel like if we do it your way, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, the data is not trustworthy and just we're losing time. Nice. Uh, in the back. You said you like to watch uh, video recordings. Yeah. Mouse going around the page. What's your favorite tool for that? Uh, hot jar is what we use the most. Hot, hot jar. Hot, hot is like a jar of uh, jam. It's really hot. Ah. Hot <laughs> jar. <laughs> it's really ch fucking cheap. Can you give a better analogy? Because I kind of missed that on the. So it's a jar of jam and. It's Whatever, cool. man. <laughs> yeah, uh, there. Uh, it's a very competitive space. There are lots of tools that do the same thing. And we had, we had a question over in this court. Yeah, you, sir. Yeah, What's your name? Sam. Sam. Um, about that structure, how did you infer or discover that they were applying for jobs while they were driving? Or is that just some? Well, yeah, we don't know. We, we just guessed yeah. uh, because it was a high, a high amount of uh, uh, mobile traffic. And when we watched the session replays of how they're using the website, there was a lot of inactivity between moments. It's like, you know. <laughs> so we just guess. We don't know, of course. You sir, what's your name? Tell me your name. Yeah, Ken. Why do so many websites seem to think the more they can, especially on computer websites, less so on mobile websites, do they see think that the more they can clutter onto their home page, the more the better, yeah. rather than the cleaner the better? I mean, that's it's, a, uh, <laughs> it's usually two things. Like one, it's politics. Every, uh, if it's a big company, every department wants a piece of the real estate. Oh, I want my promotion here because my salary de depends on this promotion that my department is running. And then another department is, has another goal and then that's, that's reason number one. And reason number two is uh, just copying what everybody else is doing. Oh, everybody else has this thing. So, oh, we have this nice empty spot here. Let's put a banner here. You know, like. Well, let's say for like CNN or NBC. Their, their mobile sites are usually nice and clean and bold, 
and they're and when you go to their computer sites, they're cluttered. And I will tell you, I looked at your national allergy site, and I found a glitch. Oh, great! On the mobile site. <laughs> Excellent. Well, they're not a client anymore. Uh, oh. <laughs> Did, uh, somebody? Uh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, so um, it's important to look at long enough uh, time spans of data and, and also look at the absolute number of people and transaction within that time period that you're looking at. So typically, uh, whatever time period I'm analyzing, I want, well, it depend, really depends on the site. Like for a small site, I want to look at the time period where it has at least 1,000 transactions happen during th this time period. So if, if that happened within 30 days, I'll look at that time period. If, if I need to go to three months, that's fine. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you have to look at the whole past year, provided that the site hasn't dramatically changed in a while. You know, if, if, if you have uh, millions of visitors, of course, those numbers change. Cool. Uh, go ahead. Uh, you talked about checkout page and polling people. Yeah. Um, what tools do you recommend? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Hotjar does that as well. Oh, it's nice. the cheap one. Or if you need more sophisticated stuff, is Qualaru with a Q. Qualaru. Cool. Thank you. Now I've got I've got a few people in the room that I wanna I wanna ask a pop. Like I wanna see what questions they generate, even though they didn't raise their hand. One of them is Tan, who's been on our stage before. Runs a really <coughs> successful website. Uh, like, what was one of your big, bigger takeaways? You're, I mean, I want to pick on people that are like really smart and who I really value. Like, maybe you didn't have a question, but what was one of your bigger takeaways? Um, we use the VJ Fog model. Uh, this is something you know, we teach people how to build habits, so that's something very familiar. Cool. And uh, I, I thought it was very interesting to see the application to conversion optimization. Because yeah. High motivation, obviously, you need that to do anything you want to do. Mm -hmm. And then having you know, we call it like the path of least resistance to get what you want to get. And so it's like the, the attribution of that. Mm -hmm. And then having the trigger in place to be sure to, to do it. So I thought it was really cool to see that. Right on. How about uh, Sean? Um, one thing I was curious about was if you ever had a client that you just didn't think they needed any changes to, like for our, for my site, I'm happy with the conversion, and it's definitely not the prettiest site <coughs> versus my competitors. But it converts well, so if you look at it, you might think it's sort of an ugly site, but it works. Like, you ever walk in there and say, there's nothing really need to change anything? Well, uh, the people mm. who are really happy about their conversion rate, of course, would not hire me, so I wouldn't find out about them. So when they say, I want to give you money, and here's my site, and it looks really, really awesome, I've never had a case where I was not able to make a difference if you give me enough time, it's like at least three months to go at it, I'll make you more money, you know? So, so every site can, can be optimized further, right? even though like we're, we're <coughs> happy with our conversion rate, like Amazon 74%, did Amazon just fire all their experimentation team? Well, no, they have 100 people designing experiments on a daily basis. They want more and more and more. Of course, for them, 1% increase is, you know, another bazillion dollars. So. <laughs> Thanks, that's a fantastic, I really appreciate that question. Um, there's there's no limit to how well you can do you know you can always do better um, Zion I know you you, you yeah you got here a little bit later but I really i like I know a lot about how you think and your 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 the success in business what, what are uh, did, did you catch enough of it or do you have any I actually had a question uh, I'm not sure if I missed it but in terms of uh, how you actually administer the surveys yeah Yeah. Are you asking them when they're action checkout page, or are you trying? I to might. So depending, I decide where to ask the question based <coughs> on how big problems are on this page. So if I see checkout page completion rate is only seventy percent, that's low in my book. And I, if, if you know, I can't spot any usability issues here. What is the problem? So I'm, I'll definitely put a poll on it. Some people will will say, oh well, won't it lower conversions? Well, if it does. The poll is there only temporarily, even though in my experience I've never seen a significant drop in conversions. Like it's it's always in within a 10% uh, relative 10% fluctuation. So you can't you don't really know whether it's because of the poll 
or because of the weather. You know, ten percent all this stuff is moving around. So, so yeah, I asked them, and the survey, the email survey, uh, send out within seven days. Um, the the sooner the better. Post post purchase is the best on the thank you page. Thank thanks for buying dog food. Now fill out the survey, and those surveys you need to incentivize. Uh, fill out the survey will give you free cookies. You know whatever. Some free services. Okay, down to the last two. Oh, what's your uh, guy's name that works with you? Alex. Alex. So my apologies. Alex, uh, you work with Pep. I'm gonna like make you sweat a little bit. What's something that you either heard him say today, or that uh, that that you've picked up from working with Pep that you're like, man, this is something I've always wanted to ask, or or something that I think I could even add to to what Pep said. Yeah, or even something that you're like, what's your favorite part of, 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 of this whole process? Because uh, I'm gonna look, I mean, for me, I, like this is all kind of new stuff for me. Like I, I do more on the affiliate side of stuff, like the, in the info, marshal, info, info, info market kind of space. So they, like, I, like I found this extremely fascinating. I texted Y earlier and I was like, are you watching this? Like this is like, like geeky stuff, but it's great. I mean, it, it, it's fantastic. So like, I'm curious, like what's, uh, what's your favorite part of uh, working with Pep? And, I'm most interested in the human aspect, so I listen to Pep on his phone calls with like executives and uh, just hearing him uh, try to you know, get through the objections that they have on uh, different issues and just uh, the whole political stuff. That's, uh, oh, that's like where one person's opinion, they, like they matter, they care more about their opinion than they do about actually testing and doing the rigor and, yeah. and how he manages the psychology of getting someone to actually listen to logic and numbers as opposed to their ego or, or, or office politics. Yeah, definitely, and that's more of an art too, so. That's awesome. Well, if you run an agency, that's half the work, is managing uh, relationships and politics, and the other cool. half is doing the actual work. Neither was a reason I asked. Like, I, I wanted to, you know, pull beyond from, like, because this is a fan, like, I was, <laughs> yeah, it was great, great stuff, so thanks. And then last but not least, I'll, Mercer, I've got a similar question for, like, what's a, what was, <clears throat> What was uh, something you heard today? Was there anything you heard today that was like, ah, I, I forgot about that, or I don't do that enough, or, or something that you thought, like, you know, anything that popped for you, or any questions? That yeah, I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna sound generic, but it's true. Like, the, him going through his system, and the framework, and the structure that he's got, like, there are no magic bullets, right? It's a process, and you'll, you'll not following the process, and, and you know, I can see my own company where I'm like, can I do better the process? Like, mm. There's this uh, famous guy who, who said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So <laughs> this is one of these useful models. It's, yeah. it's not perfect, but it works, you know, it's, it's right. useful. The framework. Framework. All right. You have one last question? Yeah, I'm just curious because uh, I like what you said Thank about you. how you can make the data basically support anything yeah. that you want. So in your experience. Can everybody hear? When you're talking about the, the politics and you're dealing with the executive, do you ever run into people who think they understand it and they have those statistics that are not the right statistics? Like they're interpreting the data wrong. And how do you yeah, deal absolutely. With can, can you repeat that? <laughs> so the, the, do I ever see executives who want to make a case uh, you know, for an argument and they, they think they have data, but actually it's bullshit. <laughs> so uh, just happened, so we work with uh, <laughs> Uh, it's like a p patient information management system for uh, for uh, clinics and chiropractors it's called uh, Kario. Anybody here uh, about this? It's huge, fucking huge. Like top ten in Inc. Fifty, whatever, gazillions of dollars. So, anyways, they just redesigned this website. I'm on a kickoff call with the client, and they this guy says it was my idea to redesign the website and I led the design efforts and it's amazing, look at these results. <laughs> and it's like the results are great, we improved like this metric by this many percentages and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, that's all great, all great. And then they give me analytics access and uh, <coughs> it's like, okay, so how, how'd you get these comparison numbers? 
oh, so let me tell you something, Google Analytics. So uh, we looked at, you know, two weeks before the launch and two weeks after the launch. You can clearly see the difference. So, oh, that's great. Well, how, but how do we know that this time period is not just unusual? Let's, so let's see what the conversion rate is now versus like three, let's go three months back. And then we saw that the old site was, you know, on average converting better than the new site. It's like he cherry picked the date range to make his case. Uh, but if we increase the sample size, you know, there was actually nothing there. I don't know how much they spent on design, but Damn. we got fired one month into the project. Uh, and uh, they, they never managed, to, they didn't even manage to get a, a single A-B test up. Uh, they said it was because we were, were too busy growing or some shit. But I, I, I have a feeling it's because I embarrassed him in, in front of everybody in, in this uh, uh, good meeting. So what would you do different in the future? Uh, just like this, is just like has technically nothing to do. Like I'm just yeah. intrigued by. So the, there's the there's um, it's a fine line between do you want to uh, have a soul or make more money? <laughs> you know, like you need to have some integrity in in what you're doing. So I tell clients in their face how their baby is ugly. You know, the baby being the website, <laughs> and then and some this sales bit can work really well. I say like. Do it like everything you have is complete shit. But that's really great news because I'm gonna make you a fucking load of money now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and not everybody likes it, and uh, that's fine. Because, you know, there's plenty of business for everybody. All right, so let's give it up for Pep. Thank you. Right. Thank you guys for coming out. <clears throat> um, thanks again to Sean and, and uh, Affiliate Summit for the food and the beer. Thanks to Capital Factory for the meeting, beautiful, beautiful meeting space. And uh, we'll see you here next month. you have a card? I do, yeah. What is $54 question? Nobody asks. What is the cost? Oh, we are very, we are very expensive. So, you know, we, we start from, from $10,000 a month. Yeah. Yeah. So we work with big and very big companies. So mostly e-commerce, SaaS, also B2B. Yeah. Which one? Sounds good. Yeah, awesome. Check out the blog, Conversion Excel. That's got lots of good stuff on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a good idea. Yeah. I, I, I notice myself, most websites I look at, and I don't know how many, I've looked at a lot over the years, most are cluttered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get a beer. Let's keep talking and, there. Uh, yeah.